when people have lived through difficult things and have made choices that have been difficult to make, you know, and come out the other side, that experience lives in us. Disinformation is spreading. There will be a we surprise so outbreak is the issue of pandemic. No social distancing at all. They, they said that they would express their concerns um, about the mask quickly. supply. Where's the mask? Where's the gloves? A second wave is possible. We, we all need some good news. news. A message for all the healthcare workers out there. Thank you. From Santa Rosa, California, I'm Cheryl Holling. Welcome to 19 Stories. A very happy Christmas to you, and thank you for joining me on this special Christmas edition. You may have noticed this particular episode is a little bit longer than most episodes, and I figured because it's Christmas, perhaps you can listen to half, have a little extra eggnog, and come back and listen to the other half hour. So without further ado, let me tell you something about Kay Bess. Over her 35 year career, Kay has consistently booked VO gigs in commercial, promo, and narration, and has done promos for every major network, as well as major cable news stations. A few years ago, she dove headlong into the world of gaming and animation, and now has an impressive list of credits in those genres. But what you may not know about her, we're going to talk about at the beginning of this episode. There are many coveted roles and avenues that Kay Bess is involved in. What we did talk about, life, hope, and what it means to be a good human, no matter what industry you're working in. So in an effort not to make this episode any longer, let's welcome our Christmas guest. Kay Bess, a very warm welcome to 19 Stories. Thank you so much, Cheryl. So nice to talk to you. Considering (laughs) the last time, and of course we've communicated via emails and social media, et cetera, but last time you and I actually had a conversation was on the patio at BPC, when Esther was in a stroller. (laughs) Brentwood Presbyterian Church, Esther in a stroller. That's fantastic. So that was like, um, I don't know, 17 years ago. (laughs) It sounds like a song, Esther in a stroller. And Esther is your lovely, beautiful daughter. The reason I remember that so well is because I was wearing a... I happened to be wearing a color that day that I don't normally wear. And someone in the choir had said that I look like a Caltrans worker. And <laughs> I, I, <laughs> what a lovely thing to say. <laughs> yes. Well, I remember that because when I, I was kind of just miffed and I'm on the patio going, I thought I looked pretty cute today. And I, and I said that, you know, out loud, a Caltrans where I, I think I mentioned it to you and you got really upset. And I thought you were my advocate for kindness even back Aww. then. So I thought that was, uh, that's why it stuck out to me all these years. Wow, what so, a great memory. Yeah. What a, cra- what a yeah. crazy memory. Well, don't ask me what I ate for breakfast yesterday. I can't right. remember yeah. that, but I can remember what happened when I was five. And I don't know if that's a sign of early senility or what, but. <laughs> I don't know. Perhaps breakfast, you need to kick it up a little, make it more memorable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm clearly not eating a breakfast of champions. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So Tell our listeners, for those who don't know you, what part of the country are you speaking to me from? I am in South Pasadena, which is a suburb of Los Angeles. Pasadena is no longer the little old lady from Pasadena. No, it's, it's so lovely. And Pasadena proper, you know, is the city right next door, um, which sits at the base of the um, Sierra Madre Mountains. And it is a gorgeous, gorgeous city and and um, just full of history and beautiful old houses and, you know, Colorado Avenue, Old Town, Pasadena, um, just a lovely place to shop and eat and, you know, and when everything's open, it's fantastic. Um, And then I live in South Pasadena, which is a separate city. And it is, of course, to the south of the city of Pasadena, but it's its own incorporated little city. Um, And it is a very, well, it's like, I don't know, 25,000 people, I think. So it's a lovely place where to raise a kid. That's what I've done. (laughs) And what a beautiful child you've raised. It's really, really lovely in Pasadena, and it's become way more hip 
than when I, I mean, it's always been beautiful, yeah. but try going to eat there on a, you know, on a regular time on a Saturday. And yeah, it's hard to get in. Speaking of regular times to go out yeah. and about and enjoy yourself, as of Monday, some of the first COVID vaccines have begun to be administered. Yeah. And I'm wondering how that has affected, you know, life down there any more than it already has. And certainly your part of town versus LA proper. Sure. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, I'm not in the city of LA, uh, but I am in the county of LA. And things have, you know, shut down quite a lot um, and several times and have been reopened and then shut down and then reopened. And, and it's, it's interesting right now we're in this strange time where small businesses are just kind of starting to push back, you know, on, um, on various restrictions. It's an interesting time to be here. And while the mayor, they have sort of laid out, they've laid out rules for how restaurants can operate. Um, and certain cities, ha you know, haven't participated. And Pasadena is one of them. Oh, um, really? And so oh. they, yeah, so they, no one is doing indoor dining. Um, but various businesses have, have gone to such great lengths to, um, you know, to be safe in how they run outdoor seating. And the city of Pasadena, you know, just opted to keep things open. I find it interesting because it really is sort of the way our government system is set up, right? That local, you know, the closer you are to home, that that's sort of what supersedes anything else, right? Like the federal government can say, here's what we suggest. And various states can say, yeah, we're going to follow that. And other states will say, no, we're not going to follow that because mm -hmm a state has more jurisdiction over its own people, right? Like that's, that's what we are. We're a nation of states, right? And, so, and then the same, like with a county, if the state says we're going to do this, a county may say, yeah, we're not going to enforce that, right? I mean, it's a fascinating thing. So right now, right now it just feels like, I don't know what's going on. You know, I don't know <laughs> what, um, I don't know what people are doing. I, I maintain what I've always done, you know, when I go out, when I go out to a business or to a store, or it, if I'm going to be somewhere that's enclosed, I put on my mask, I wash my hands, I, you know, I keep distance, I, you know, and I feel like that's, you know, that's my part, you know, um, and it it hasn't, it has had so little bearing on what you and I do for a living. Um, because we're already working from home. And so it, it, in certain ways, jobs that I might ordinarily do at a studio are now being done at home, but that's, but I'm already set up, you know, it, 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 I didn't have to change anything. You know, I think the only thing I really had to do was I had to get um, Source Connect, which I didn't have. I, I used IPTTL, but it was like, okay, I'll get Source Connect, you know, so, but otherwise my day-to-day -day life is kind of, as it has been. And the same with schooling my daughter. You know, I've been homeschooling her since she was in sixth grade. So even that didn't shift. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I was going to ask you about that, whether or not that has affected Esther and her schooling. But if you've been schooling, it's so interesting. I'm, I'm meeting more people who've been doing that for a long time. And for yeah. those people, yeah. Of course, it's not like to coin the phrase, it's not a pivot they have to make. It's something they've been doing for a long time. So they're like, yes. okay, the rest of the world is catching up with me or with us. Yes, yes, in many ways, yes. I think the thing that has pivoted for us is that um, my daughter's social life was really about her church life, you mm. know, and going to youth group and hanging out with those kids. They would get together on Wednesdays and then they'd get together on Sundays. And that ended, you know, that in-person stuff ended. And so I think that was difficult for her. She's very social and very gregarious and outgoing and extroverted. And But they've made, you know, the shift to to Zoom meetings and gatherings and stuff like that. And she's acclimated. She's such a good natured person. <laughs> and she kind of rolls with, with whatever is happening. So she's found a groove in that way, right? Where she gets the best social interaction that she can, given the circumstance. And so she's doing really well. And I just feel really fortunate because I know a lot of kids are having, and parents are having a difficult time adjusting. So I just feel fortunate in that way. I mean, we went through our own adjustments when I took her out of public school in sixth grade. She was really, oh, really? pissed off at me for at least a year and a half. You know, oh yeah, she was mad. 
Yeah. So, you know, we make our adjustments, but that, but, but even then, even when I pulled her out of school, then she still could see her friends, you know, she could still go and do. And, you know, so that's the added piece, right. Of kids who are not only are they schooling at home, which is unusual. They also can't see their friends. I mean, so that's huge. That's a huge, yeah, it's a double whammy impact. because they have to adjust yeah. the two things, not just yeah. one, whereas Esther's, you know, been adjusting for yeah. some time and, you know, kids are really yeah. flexible that way. And we certainly have a lot to, I don't, you know, I have a, a stepdaughter that doesn't, has never lived with me and uh, she lives in another state now, but just observe, you know, being with kids, observing them, you see how flexible and adaptable and some aren't though. And that's hard. I think it has a lot to do yeah. with the parenting, of course. Look at Esther's mama. You know, you've been pivoting your whole professional life. And I, I want to talk about that. There's so much that you're doing right now, Kay, that yeah. is, you know, it's really interesting when you watch someone from afar and, you know, you see their social life, you see their professional life from afar. You really get a sense that underneath it all, it's just a really genuine, solid person that's in that. And no matter what they're doing, mm -hmm. they're going to be that person. And that's not always the case. You know, there's some people who are in one aspect of a career and they go into something else and they're not able to adjust or, you know, um, they they become something or yeah. someone else. So I want to go back because it's really interesting for, again, people who may not be aware of you. You started out at an early age, and I'm not sure what year you conquered this as a child, but you started out with a severe stutter and yet you were able to turn into yeah. one of the most well-respected and talented voiceover artists so how did that happen <laughs> well i still sort of have a stutter and it uh it shows up when i am caught off guard by someone or something that uh it feels a little bit emotionally threatening mm. um and so i think that's a piece of it that you know, it's that being taken by surprise and not knowing what I'm going to say, you know, not having the opportunity for some forethought about what I'm going to say. Um, so it still lurks, you know, but it's so infrequent um, that it comes up, you know, that I sort of, I obviously give the impression that it's something I have conquered. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, I, I'd say so. To, I mean, to a large degree, I have. And the large degree, I mean, the thing, really is that I understand it. I know where it comes from. Um, and I know that it's not speech mechanics, it's, it's an emotional response. So in that way, it's something that I can continue to master and seek to understand and sort of find out what triggers it and, and all of those kinds of things. But I will say this, I didn't even know that I stuttered until I was seven or eight years old. And my family used to go at Christmas time a few years in a row, we went to Yosemite and we rented a cabin and sometimes we went with friends. And um, this one particular year, I was probably seven or eight and there were some friends there and somebody brought a tape recorder, right? An old school tape recorder. And my sister and I, we loved, you know, shows like Laugh-In and, you know, loved watching when my mother would let us stay up watching Johnny Carson and interview mm. shows and variety mm -hmm. shows, right? Those kinds of things. Love them. The, the, yes. Yes. The number of variety shows that happened in the 60s and 70s, it was just awesome. Um, not the best TV. Uh, totally. Yes. Absolutely. And the best music. Um, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. With <laughs> Barnum. Yeah. And um, so my sister and I decided that we were going to record a little variety show on this tape recorder you know, and our friends were going to help us and we were going to do little sketches and things like that. And so we proceeded to record. And when we played things back, I heard myself stutter. Really? And prior to that, I didn't even, I didn't experience myself as stuttering. And so it was all of a sudden I became self-conscious. And prior to that, you know, my parents never brought it to my attention. They just listened to me and you know, it wasn't ever, an issue was never made of it. And that's what's so cool when you were telling me that I thought, what loving people you had around you, because that's not always the case. Kids oh, and yeah. siblings can be really cruel. Yes. And, and the fact that you didn't even know that until you heard yourself. Yeah. Kind of weird, right? <laughs> I, I, I even, yeah. even saying it, I think, wow, isn't that so interesting? Because I'm so self-aware now that the idea that 
I wasn't aware that I stuttered is just so crazy to me. But I think I was just busy being a kid, um, mm, cool. which is a nice thing. But then to become so self-aware at that age, you know, that probably you know, triggered its own thing. But um, but I do remember that my father, he sort of took the lead in, in my parenting when I was in grade school. And I went to see what my dad referred to as the speech therapist. And I, I later came to understand that that was the school psychologist, um, which was kind of amazing, you know, oh. that in public school and oh. in, in Goleta, California, that they had a, that they a school had psychologist. One, yeah. yeah. What I remember of it, it was a very positive and affirming experience. But I think that my stutter just gradually worked itself out. And I think that it did as I became who I was becoming, you know, as I participated in with friends in school activities. And I came to sort of understand what my gifts were and the things I was capable of doing. And, you know, those kinds of things. I think it just worked itself out by virtue of my becoming a sort of creative type. And I wanted to ask you whether an or not singing had anything to do with that. Because when I first met you, I knew of you as a singer. And that's how I came to know you. I knew. Yeah. Uh, and for those of you who have not heard Kay sing, she's, I mean, it's really a gift that you have. And, you know, I was in yeah. awe of you as a singer. And then I came to find out, of course, about your voiceover career. So did that have anything to do with you being able to you know, literally and figuratively find your voice? I think so. I mean, I remember who was the singer? Oh my gosh, there was a, a, a country singer. Um, oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. What is his name? Um, I want to say, oh gosh, I'll totally embarrass myself by saying the wrong person, but I know who you're speaking of. That's another thing that goes out the window is... I know. <laughs> it's like an older is remembering names, right? Yeah, he was He was a very, probably probably in the 60s and 70s, I want to say. He was, a, he was a prominent country mm -hmm. singer who had a severe stutter, and but he never stuttered when he sang. And that's why I ask that, because most stutters don't stutter right, when they sing. Right, right. I did not stutter when I sang, and I think that probably was a part of it. There's a flow to singing. There's a measure to the breath. There's sort of deep breathing in singing, you know. Um, you have to really tank up, you know, sometimes to finish a phrase the way you want to finish it and, um, and things like that. So I'm sure that that felt very liberating to me to be able to sing and not stutter for sure. But I can't point to a particular time where I just stopped stuttering. I think it's just more time has, you know, transpires before an event where I stutter, you know, so it might, it might go where as, you know, in the beginning, it was every day. And then, you know, then perhaps for a few hours, I didn't. And then for a few days, and then something would happen, you know, and now it's like years, and then something will happen. Like just the other day, I, I was on a flight, I was coming home from Oregon, and got up to speed on our takeoff. And then suddenly the flight was aborted, aborted. And um, they were turning back. Well, we went out on the runway, right? And we, mm -hmm. we started the takeoff, got up to speed, and then they cut the engines and aborted the flight. Okay. And why? Because um, a light came on, uh, a sensor came on indicating a problem with the de-icing mechanism on the wings. In Oregon? Was it that cold? I mean, I'm not being well, as it was it that cold or? No, no. De-icing, I mean, it is well below zero when you're flying at 30,000 Oh, feet. I see. Where, okay. So that mechanism is always at play, right? Or if you're flying through weather, I mean, I'm completely, I'm obviously not a pilot, so I'm speaking out of turn. <laughs> you but mean you're not? Oh, come I on, know, okay. I'm With not, everything yeah, else you do, you're not a pilot? Yes. Some things I just, I just, I just didn't have time for. <laughs> um, uh, it is a mechanism that if it is not properly functioning, it is never safe to fly. And that's what the pilot said. It's that light came on, we aborted. We can't okay. fly okay. if there's an issue with that. So while it was happening, I didn't, you know, I wasn't panicked or anything like that, you know. So we stopped on the runway and got off the runway, went back to the gate. And then there was, you know, there was a question about whether or not, I mean, obviously the mechanics were going to come out and look at everything and see what was up. And there was a question as to whether or not we would deplane. And I, and I was thinking to myself, I have to get off this plane. Like, I can't, I can't be on this plane. I'm not flying so on this plane. A little bit of a panic thing? Is that? A little bit, yeah. 
And as soon as we pulled into the gate and the pilot said to the flight attendant, we're going to deplane. And shortly thereafter, you know, I went back to where I had been staying and I realized in the middle of the conversation about it that I was stuttering, you know, and I think it was that scary circumstance. I've never been a, well, I have a history of being a fearful flyer, but in the, in the last decade, I have not been. And so it was almost like that incidence of getting to truly where we're just, the nose is just about to come up and we abort the flight. It sort of triggered this thing in me like, oh, 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 you know? And so it was interesting that in the talking about it and processing of it and what it felt like and all of that, I stuttered a bit, you know? And it was like, wow, I haven't stuttered in a long time, you know? So again, it's something that it sort of lives there, but um, for the most part, it doesn't show itself. It's kind of interesting when we get unnerved about something or like you say, if it's in an uncomfortable situation or something comes up that you feel a little off kilter, how it can press into those things and those areas of our life that we haven't visited for a while. And that sounds like that's what happened to you. Yes. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, Kay, I don't even know where to start with you. Seriously. I mean, we have started. It's not like I've been over here sleeping. I'm just so, so happy to have you here and have this time with you. And all the things that I'm looking at yeah. that you've been doing lately and been very encouraged by because you've yeah. started a, and I think maybe this is, this is where I'll, I'll pivot to is your business and coaching website sure. has a really interesting name that I think out of all the qualities that, you know, a person could possess or wish for someone else, it's called trust and be brave. And so I'm curious if you could speak to that. Like, how did you yeah. come upon those two? And then I'll ask you a couple of other questions after that. Sure. Yeah. A couple of years ago, 2019, I was asked by Gerald Griffith to give the keynote speech at Bio Atlanta. Bio Atlanta. And I had never done a keynote before. Um, I was a little surprised that he asked me. I, I had just met him at the 2018 um, conference, and I guess he just thought I you know, seemed like a helpful and cheerful person. <laughs> um, and so I think he, I honestly, I feel like he, he just decided to kind of take a chance. You know, I think he probably talked to people about, you know, my history and voiceover and knew that I wasn't like, you know, an ax murderer in disguise, you know, like I, I wasn't like, I actually presented myself to be the person that I am. You know? yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, um, but I, so I accepted the challenge, you know, um, which it felt like to me, it was really scary. I'd never gotten up in front of people and spoken for 45 minutes. That's how um, long it was? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's quite, you know, for somebody who's never done that before, it was like, wow, how do I even, how do I figure out what to say and how do I organize it? And what do I, you know, how do I put it together? And and do I need slides? And should there, you know, like all these, do I need like, a PowerPoint? you know, you see people, yeah, do I need, do I need PowerPoint? Uh, truly, that was a question, like, how do, how does one do this? And so through the course of the year, I figured all those things out. You know, I, I, I was really tasked with sort of being an inspiration to people who were there at the conference, you know, and the, um, I'm trying to think of what the, oh, the theme of the conference was refresh. So, you know, I had that in the back of my mind and I knew that I would be incorporating stories about my own career and, you know, and then on top of that, it's like, what does it mean to refresh when, when, you know, mm -hmm. what does that mean to a voice actor, you know? And so, you know, the, the essence of it really was that, yes, we can do all these things. We can redo our websites and, and get some training and, and redo our demos. And, and those are all ways in which we do refresh. And yet for me, I think what was even more important and what is most important to a working person in voiceover is to know who you are and to be grounded and confident in the person that you are mm -hmm. when you step up to the microphone. Because what any director or producer or creative person wants from a voice actor is you. They want you. They don't want you imitating anybody else. They don't want you trying to sound like the current, you know, trend. They want you to be you. So that's where my keynote shifted because I realized that a big piece of what makes my career what it is uh, and has been is this constant desire to know who I am. And that pursuit of mine has enhanced my career. 
um, kind of not by accident. I mean, I think it, it came along with it that my desire to know and understand myself, what my purpose is in life, right? My purpose in life is not to be a voice actor. It's something deeper than that. And so I think that pursuit that I was on, it extended to my career. And I realized that knowing who I was, knowing what I valued, knowing what I loved and who I loved and you know, that all had a bearing on my level of confidence in my career. And so I am fine to turn things down that I don't think fit me. I'm fine if I don't book a job that I really wanted to book because I am not my career. And so I incorporated that idea into my keynote. And I think that it really resonated with people. It was shocking to me the extent to which it resonated. I spent the entirety of the weekend at that conference listening to people's stories. Mm. I could get teary about it, right? Like that people just felt like they could be safe with me. Mm -hmm. If I was willing to reveal my life and my story and my struggles, my ups, my downs, they had permission to do the same. I was about to use that word, permission. You gave them a permission to be open and vulnerable and real. Yeah, and real. And isn't that what we're all after in voiceover? I mean, isn't that the spec we get the most? Real. We want somebody real. You know, the use of that term, trust and be brave, it came from a phrase that my father used to use with me. Oh, really? How beautiful. My father's a retired American Baptist minister. And um, so I grew up in the church and, you know, it's still still a big part of my life. And um but he used to say to us, not, not just me, but to, you know, all three of his children, he used to say, trust God and sin bravely. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> what, and sin, sin, bravely? sin bravely. And, you know, as a kid and a teenager, it was like, what, what do you, what does that mean? You know? Yeah. And so what I have come to understand that, that it means is that um, my life is not my own. My life belongs to God. And that, to be human is to make mistakes and to live boldly in life. You are bound to make mistakes. And those mistakes encompass things like, you know, inadvertently hurting people, right? Causing, mm. causing difficulties, you know, as good of parents as we might be, we're still going to mess up our children because we parent imperfectly. Well, we're imperfect people parenting yeah. other imperfect people, right? Exactly. And sometimes our marriages don't survive, you know, and we, in our fear and our, and our frustration and our sorrow, we do and say things we don't really mean. So to, to live and to, to discover who you are, what your purpose is and all that means that you're going to make mistakes. And I, so I think that what, what my dad meant was, you know, trust God, right? Trust that Trust that your life has value and worth, that you're here for a purpose, and live boldly. Mm. If you're going to make mistakes, make them big, right? Don't walk timidly through life. And that that's what that has come to mean to me. It doesn't mean, you know, to go out and intentionally be, you know, selfish and, and hurt people. It's not that. It's just inevitable that if I'm, if I'm in a relationship that isn't, prosperous, that's not doing well, that isn't serving either person. And I'm the one who says, I have to break this relationship off because I believe it to be the best thing for each of us. That's still painful. You know, it's difficult and you, you hurt someone in the process, you know. Um, and yet that could be a move that eventually allows both of you to flourish in another direction. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I came to understand what my what my father meant. And so I took that phrase, trust God and sin bravely. And I, I knew I'm not talking to a group of religious people. You know, it's, that, that's, that isn't necessarily language that, that's going to resonate with the majority <laughs> of the people there. Right. Probably and not. so, I, yeah. So I just shifted it and I said, trust and be brave. And that's where that phrase came from. My belief that we have to trust that we are where we're supposed to be and we are experiencing what we're supposed to experience. And if we're going to make progress in our lives, we have to we have to be brave. We have to step out and do things. We have to take risks and we have to do things that are uncomfortable. And because it's, it's in the discomfort where we 
where we affect change in our lives and we make and progress. And we grow, yeah. And we learn Absolutely. and then we grow. Yeah. So that's where that came from. And interestingly enough, I'm still in the process of putting together kind of a coaching program. And part of putting together the program, it's been a long process because I really want it to be good and I want it to be helpful and I want it to be meaningful to people. And so part of the process has been finding out what my voiceover colleagues need. What do they need? Where are the barriers? What are the struggles? What are the obstacles that are in the way? And I had this idea of what I was going to offer, you know, as a course and I had my plan and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then it was suggested to me, like, go and interview, you know, the sort of ideal person who you think might be interested in this course and go ask them those questions. Like, what are you struggling with? What keeps you from doing your best work? You know, and everything that came back to me had something to do with imposter syndrome, Boy. not knowing what to do in the booth not having any confidence, not, no one is there to direct me. How do I know if I'm doing the right thing? And someone in response to one of these questions, because I posed the question on LinkedIn and on Facebook, and one person responded to me and said, you know, sort of named those things, right? Like just, you know, trying not to be overwhelmed by imposter syndrome, you know, and, and then, and then they said, but I have a sign up in my booth that says, trust and be brave. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, I thought, my goodness, like I was taken aback by it. Like, I think that resonated. And so I thought I should incorporate that. That's still what everyone I talk to is longing for support, you know, to, to learn how to be brave and to step in confidently and to direct themselves and you know, and those are acts of bravery and courage, you know, in voiceover land, you know, where you're stepping in and it's just you in the booth. And so that's how I named it that, you know, I, I named it just based on, you know, what I, what began at a, you know, as a keynote in VO Atlanta in 2019. And then I realized was still kind of resonating. Absolutely people. resonating with everybody. And so. is that interesting that at a time you know, there's coaches out there who are just like grind and crush it and, you know, go after it. And, you know, all this kind of not saying that doesn't have a place with the right people, but sure, it yeah, certainly yeah. doesn't allow room to say, you know what, I'm pretty scared. I don't really feel that way. I don't present myself that way, et cetera. I mean, you touched upon something that, you know, to trust and be brave is, Allowing people to trust themselves. I mean, this whole imposter syndrome, I mean, that is such a phrase I hear all the time. I certainly deal with it. I mean, yeah. I'll do something and then, you know, it'll take my husband and tell me, Cheryl, you just did the very thing you say you can't do. Do you realize that? <laughs> right. right. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess I did. But I'm focusing yeah. on the fact that maybe I didn't do it the way I thought I should have or, you know, whatever, wherever those voices come from. But it is such a, talk well, about a pandemic, you know, to that right. thing about imposter syndrome, like as if just being yourself is an imposter. Well, who are you supposed to be while being yourself? Right. Right. And so I'm that, that's so crucial because that's a piece where I feel like, yeah, part of my job as a coach is to say, get comfortable with yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you are unique. There's nobody like you. And to be able to encourage people to begin to embrace the truth of that. Like that, there's nobody like Cheryl Holling. There's no one. Nobody has your fingerprint. Nobody's got your parents and the birth date and that, right? All lined up and combined the way it was to make you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nobody like you. And so it's just a huge part of success in any area. It just so happens that we're talking about voiceover, but, you know, to be able to bring your full self to your work, knowing that yourself is enough, is, an, is yeah, it's more than enough. It's, it's, it's what, it's what you need. Like if you don't bring you, well, you know, who are you going to bring? <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll say too, that I, I think it isn't just this idea of being brave in the booth, it's being brave enough to when, when, cause I see the same things that you do, you know, on, in, on social media and I see the push, push, push. And I see this pressure to perform, perform, perform. And if you're not doing, if you're not eating, breathing, you know, drinking voiceover 24 seven, you're not doing enough. And, and, and I think you have to 
trust your path and be brave enough to stand against that kind of thinking. Oh, it's crazy. It's it, yeah, it's insane. And so my thing is, is like, are you a parent? Is, has COVID made it such that your voiceover career has taken a back seat to your need to homeschool your children? Great. Do that. Yes. Do that because your children are more important. Right. Yeah. And, and it will make you a deeper, richer, more complex person. When you choose to love the people that you're responsible for and put your energy there, it makes you that much more complex and that much more beautiful and that much more interesting, frankly. You know, when people have lived through difficult things and have made choices that have been difficult to make, you know, and come out the other side, that experience lives in us, right? So now, like when I get some, when I get some piece of copy that says, you know, I want, we want a middle-aged woman who has some wisdom, you know, live because of the year, how she's, the years she's lived. Yep, I go, check. yeah, I got that. <laughs> yeah, check. Check. That you know, and I, and there's not, yeah, th- there's not a thing I have to put on my voice, you know, put on in air quotes, right? I don't have to, I don't have to pretend because it is my life. And so I had this conversation with a student once where she was struggling with a piece of copy. It was character of a mom you know, expressing concern about her children. And she was really struggling with the copy about, you know, where to place it and how it should be. And I just don't know, you know, and I said, well, you're a mom, right? She goes, yeah. And I said, how old is your daughter? She's 16. I'm like, well, there you go. There's nothing you have to put on. You are the spec. So just read the copy. And and it was like, she had this sort of light bulb, like, Oh. oh, 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 I am that person. You know, I, I possess that knowledge. I possess that compassion. I understand the complexity of that, of the compassion for your kid when your kid's driving you crazy and they're being difficult, but you love them. You know, that's a complex, it's a complex expression of love. You know, when your kid is driving you insane, but you've got, but you have to love them. (laughs) You know, So, so it was almost like, it was like this light bulb went on, like, oh, I, I am that person. I don't, I don't have to pretend. So I feel like that's a piece of what I'm after in my coaching that encompasses, you know, universal ideas about how one coaches. It's not, again, it's not necessarily specific to voiceover, but, but voice actors rarely hear that specific to them. It's more like work on your commercial read and work on your promo read and, and all that. So. Well, it's the balance of life or even if it's unbalanced, I mean, live life. So you have life to put in the mic. Absolutely. I I mean, if you come, if your life has just been sublime for most of it and you haven't known hardship, I mean, God bless you, but this is going to sound weird, but is that interesting? No, I know. I know. It's, it, isn't it, isn't it always that, you know, like I, I watched, um, Anthony Hopkins. I, I, I was on Twitter, which I'm not I'm rarely on Twitter, but I was on Twitter and I, and Anthony Hopkins came across my feed and he was, you know, sitting at his dining room table. It, he looked like, God, he's older than God, you know, like he's really aged <laughs> at, which of course he has, he's like in his eighties, you know, and, um, and he had this just remarkable, beautiful face full of lines and yeah, the sound was down and he just, he was just talking, you know, at his dining room table and I turned the sound up and I realized he was doing a soliloquy from Hamlet. Oh. And I and I listened to it and and it was like, oh my God. Like I understood every word. I, I understood every idea. I understood every emotion and thought that was present in that that in those Shakespeare, you know, in those words of Shakespeare, right? And it was like his age and his experience and his wisdom and the life that he's lived along with him being an extraordinary actor, sure. God, he was just, I watched that and I thought, what a beautiful man. And, and I was just so compelled and, and drawn in to what he had to say, you know, and, and how he was saying it and the fact that he could communicate it so clearly and there was no effort in it. And it was like, well, of course not, because he's lived all those. It's not affected. Um, it's real. Yeah. It's, God, it was beautiful. And so here we are, we try, you know, we try to pretend that we don't, you know, we get lots of Botox and we do, you know, uh, guilty, you know, like, uh, like we, like we, because we live in this culture of like, where we 
um, where we think we have to be perfect and beautiful and no lines and, oh. and not overweight. And, you know, we have to look a certain way and we have to be fit and we have to dress like this because it makes us, you know, sort of perfectly presentable. And it's like, wait a second, is that really what we're after? <laughs> you know, well, I got to um, say, I part, a lot of that is really as much as I love Los Angeles, I was born and raised there. That's why I moved away. I mean, yeah. Awful. As you know, <laughs> you know, unless you're you're doing something right out of the womb in Los Angeles, you know, forget being a you know mid forties yeah. woman and you haven't been married and oh, like yeah. what's wrong with you and you have more. I actually had someone tell me you have more of a chance of being struck by lightning than getting married after your forties. And I was like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? You say to that. First of all, maybe I haven't wanted to be married yeah, at, up yeah. until this point. It's interesting because I had an initial consultation with a coach a couple of months ago, and she said, you have a real thing about turning 60. And part of me did and part of me didn't. Part of me is like, you know what? As you were referring to Anthony Hopkins, yeah. I've earned these yeah. lines. I've earned every single one of these stripes, and I'm proud of it because I've survived yeah. some yeah. life, you know, and I own that. But the old yeah. crap of LA and that whole, you know, what you just spoke on. And I understand it. Look, if your face is your money maker and you've, you know, that's how you've made your money your whole life, I can understand that. And yet it's really nice to be where you don't necessarily have to worry about, it, although more and more people are doing, you know, uh, video auditions yeah, yeah. or, you know, with the whole nature of the business yeah. is changing where more and more people want to see you. And yeah, totally. Yeah, it's an interesting turn in, in voiceover, I think. And I will say, you know, with regard to on-camera acting, honestly, like my heroes are Helen Mirren and Judy Dench. Judy like Dench. I, they're, they're just, you know, she's on the cover. What is she? She's on she's uh, on, Vogue. Is yeah. it Vogue? Yeah, and I think she's like, she's 85. You know what? Rock on, woman. She's, she's amazing. And I look at her and I go, oh my God, what a beautiful woman. Like, I just want to be like her you know, and so they're out there, you know, we have to pick and choose, you know, who we want to emulate. And I think it's really, really easy for us to emulate youth, because that's what Hollywood is about. But just because it's the most prominent thing for us to see and follow doesn't mean we have to, right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and we can sort of put our aim elsewhere, but we have to be super, super conscious of it, you know, and do it very deliberately. That's what I have done too. You know, like I just, I could stand to lose 20 pounds, but it's like, I really love eating. <laughs> I enjoy food. You know, it's a, it's a great pleasure in life, It is, you know, to, to cook and to eat and to drink wine and, you know, have something sweet. I mean, that, that's not, I'm not like that every day, but, but still it's like, I, why? So I can fit somebody else's standard Just of beauty. Say that, is that, yeah. is that what we're after? Like, I, you know, so Again, that's a piece of what I am working on too. Is like I, I have to, I have to keep learning to get comfortable in my own skin, accept myself as I am, you know, all of those things. Like, um, well, you're very self-aware, Kay. I mean, that's you know, that's the big part of the the battle is even being aware that you would know that because a lot of people wouldn't take the time yeah. to go that deep and that far. But that extends into just everything you've started talking about as far as your work in voiceover or whatever you're doing is that's the work, but who you are in that work is your ministry. It's who you are as a person. How are yeah. you acting and reacting? How are you affecting other people? Allowing yourself yeah. grace when you're, you know, a messy human, right? Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, there is so much. Literally, I thought I'm just going to end this podcast with Kay because 19 stories, I could fill it all up with her stories. And um, speaking of which, <laughs> your podcast, because still listen yeah. to past episodes, believe it or not. I listened to one the other day with your agent, which I thought was so delightful. And I thought, so I want to be at that party. I think if there's a, a regret, if you will, is I don't have a, a glass of red wine or some bubbly to offer you, right? right? So is that something yeah. that you did for a season in your life and you're moving on to other things? Because so that's the first question you did mention in one of your blogs, and it was the one on self-sabotage, which really, really resonated with me. And I just, girlfriend, you are in my journal these days. I think I even emailed you once of like, what is what is going on? <laughs> but, you know, I think maybe it has to do with where we're at in life. Yes. Yeah. 
They are peers. Yeah, for sure. But I totally. Oh, yeah. Your podcast. So is that yeah. something that you'll eventually have new episodes or was that for a time in your life or, you know, what you what your voice was at the time? Yeah. Um, well, I started that podcast in, in a, uh, a low season in my voiceover career where I was feeling like, oh, I, you know, things are slow. And I felt like I needed to do something creative. And I, and I try to do things that where I can highlight other people. I love that setting and circumstance, right? So, so the thought that I could do a podcast about women in voiceover who, you know, we so often we do kind of fly under the radar and maybe we do promos, but we don't have a promo account for 10 years. Like so many men do, right. Where it's like, it's like, we're still, even after all this time, we're still kind of a novelty. I, I, we're not like we used to be, but we still have that kind of, you know, it's, it's a little bit like when you hear some, somebody say, um, yeah, let's, let's get a woman, <laughs> you know, and you feel, you feel a little bit like, let's get the monkey, you know, let's, you know, whereas I experienced this, I have seen this and experienced this, particularly in promo, where if a network is looking for a voice, a male voice, they will say, let's get Rena Romano, or let's get Bill Ratner, or let's get Joe Cipriano, or let's get Steve Mackel, or let's, it's very specific, right? Let's get the guy. Let's get Steve. Let's get Joe. And they're really thinking about a very unique and specific talent that they're after, right? And then when it comes to females, that they say, we need a woman. We need a woman. And I, and I think about that and I go, you know, we have names too. Exactly. And we have really interesting and unique voices too. And we just haven't been given as much airtime for anybody to, you know, for, for you to develop your brand around. And so that was a big piece of my thinking when I started the Beehive podcast was like all these women I know who are extraordinarily talented and who have, you know, they're cobbling their voiceover careers together, um, just like me, you know, and doing everything we can to keep our careers long and fruitful. And nobody knows our names. And so that was my intent. And I did it to, you know, it was twofold. It was like, I want to do something creative because I feel like I'm in a kind of in a drought. And then I thought, well, I also, I just want to stand up for my girlfriend, you know, and say, like, look at this amazing, talented person. Look at what she has done. Look at what she's done that you have listened to all these years and you didn't even know it was yeah. her. And so that was a big piece of it. And I, and I did it for, I think I have some like 30, 33, 34 episodes. I mean, I was doing it all myself and I was very, <laughs> yeah, I was right. My hand over here. Yeah. Yeah. And I was very particular and I edited every single one. And because we were sometimes drinking wine, you know, there were times when things got, I think a little too personal. And so I was very aware, very conscientious and very mindful that there might be things in there that, that somebody might not really want to say. And so I went through my episodes with a fine tooth comb and I really edited seamlessly and I, you know, I did all of that. And at a certain point, you know, work started to pick back up and it was like, oh my goodness, I don't have time to do this. But I still wasn't and still am not, you know, at a point where I could have hired an editor. But I do think about doing a podcast. And whether it is that same format and I continue to do that is, is another story. But, it, but I think a piece of my coaching, the development of my coaching program will include a podcast. I'm particularly interested in interviewing people with somewhat sizable careers. And I want to hear their do or die stories, like the, the obstacles and the hurdles and the things they had to get over. Because most people look at really successful voice actors and think that they, have, they haven't suffered through anything. And they have, you know, and they have surmounted the things that many voice actors today are going through. And so I want to offer that as inspiration to people who may be stuck. And, you know, if you heard from a guy like Rob Paulson about the year that he was so stuck, you know, and wasn't booking work and wasn't getting auditions and what, right? Like, really? That happened to Rob Paulson after he had won an Emmy. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of, I'm interested in doing that as a piece of my coaching program as kind of an offering in it. But I really, I, I, I have to make a decision about that, about like, well, how, 
perfect are you going to require it to be? Like, because it, can you let it roll and live with what it is and put it to air? Or do you have to go through all of the machinations? Just of, about of, to say that of what it means to put it together. And yeah, exactly. For people who haven't yeah. heard it, it is, can you say the website? It can access it through your coaching site. You can. Which we're going to post that in show notes. And then your coaching site is trustandbebrave.com. Is that correct? Dot com. Yes. And and I really, all that's really up on my coaching site is my blog at the moment. I'm, I'm developing a, a program that'll be up there eventually, but I, you know, I'm getting everything kind of in place. You can access everything from my page, which is kbest.com. So you can access my podcast and you can also access my blog. That's how you and I connected to get to this point because you are sharing vulnerabilities in a way that you've encouraged people, obviously at Theo Atlanta to, to be brave and yeah. you know, your yeah. topics of self-sabotage in the Valley of Despair. And I never wanted to be a voice actor and eternal truths of voiceover and getting real and raw and sharing that. And I think people only look up to that and, and respect it. Yeah. Because we tend to, like you said, people who are successful, that they don't know what it's like to be an average bear. Well, how do you think they got there? How do you think you got there? Yeah. It's very rare that people are, you know, served their careers with a silver spoon. And if they are, they usually don't last. Oh, I, I don't know a single successful voice actor who had their career handed to them. I, I guess I'm referring more to on camera. Sure. Yes. Um, I do think that that's a, a pervasive myth, though, e even in voiceover. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, those guys, they, they, you know, they got, you know what I'm saying? I think, I think this idea that, you know, they just sort of popped onto the scene <laughs> and, script. you know, yeah. created 500 anim animated characters, you know, is just a misnomer. Uh, but that, but that's what happens when you, when, when all of a sudden we've got social media with people's pictures and people have websites and all of a sudden we have an image to maintain. You know, I participate in that too. It's like uh, by virtue of the, the fact that I have websites, you know, and pictures on it. And, you know, that's, um, unfortunately that's the demands of what this business is right now. Totally. Yes. Yeah. It's like you have to play the game, but you can't be taken in by it. You, you know, you uh, that's really the trick. It's like play the game and then step back from it. It's like, sure. Yes. I need a website and I need my website to be the best that it can be. And I need my demos to be great, you know, and then I'm going to go make dinner for my kid, you know, yes. and I'm going to go to the gym, you know, right? Like, and I got to vacuum, pay, you know, pay my you know, bills all the, and, you know, like, the toilet and I gotta you know, pay my bill, all the other know? things. Of life. Yeah. All those things. Yes, exactly. My direct Beehive podcast website is the beehive podcast.com. And it's just the letter B, the letter B hive podcast.com. The beehive and I hope people stop listen. So the word B as in the flying thing is not spelled out. It's just the letter. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gave a wonderful vehicle to introduce some really fascinating women. And you had a couple of drones in there, right? Yeah, I did. Tom Pinto and Townsend Coleman, I, when, I, when I was at, in 2018, uh, when I was at my very first VO Atlanta, um, I was asked to do a podcast from there. And I was like, the people I, that are here that I know I've, are, have already been on the podcast, you know, like Celia Siegel and uh, Mary Lynn Wisner. It was sort of like, I don't know who I would. And then I thought, well, I'm just going to have Townsend and, and uh, Tom Pinto on, and it'll just be an unusual. They're two wonderful <laughs> people. They were great drones to have yeah. visit oh, the yeah. hive. So I love the organic nature of podcasts because you can prepare, you know, it's kind of like improv. You have your all yeah. your questions and you have a conversation with somebody and you go, all right, well, I can go with the flow or try and get all these in here because I feel like in some ways I've done a, a disservice because there's so much we haven't talked about in regards to your career. And yet people, we're going to point them towards your information, those that don't know you and those that do know you, of course, are following what you're doing. So I'm curious with all that's going on and how you, again, to use the term pivoting, how do you self-care. I mean, you've touched on some of it is what you do for yourself and, and kind of not feed into the fears of what you should be doing. But what do you do to practice self-care these days? Such a good question. I probably need to do a lot more of uh, self-care. At the, at the real root of it for me, foundationally, is sleep. Mm -hmm. I am useless without sleep. 
it sets off a domino effect that I can't, that the day can't recover from, you know, something I, I struggle with in fits and starts, you know, it, 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 it's an interesting thing. At the end of February, I was in the best shape that I have ever been. I was the leanest that I've been in a very long time. Um, I was eating really well. I was getting great rest and sleep. I was doing well booking, you know, like things were just, it was like clickety click, 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 you know, everything was just kind of working and COVID came along and I thought, well, it's just temporary, you know, I'll get back on the, uh, you know, this place where I used to go and do yoga it closed and it was like, well, it won't be long. I, I, I'll do it from home. And it was like, oh my God, doing it from home is just not the same. And, you know, all of those kinds of things. And then it was like, oh, I'm going to make bread, you know, and then of course, and along with that comes like eating the entire loaf eating, because eating it's so bread, good. Gorgeous bread. Oh my, oh my gosh. gosh. So I, good. It's an art to make sourdough bread. <laughs> I know. Yeah, you can't bake it and not eat and it. I'm going to take pictures and throw it in the trash. I know. I took, a, I took a lot of loaves to people just locally, you know, but, uh, but I ate a lot of it too. Um, and over <laughs> the course of, you know, over the course of the, the year of 2020, you know, I gained a good solid 10 pounds, like solid 10 pounds. Well, I know it? I have not, um, my eating hasn't really been great. Um, I haven't exercised with any regularity whatsoever. And it was like three weeks ago, I got pissed. I got mad. You know, it was sort of like, I got mad at 2020, you know, I got mad at COVID and thinking, you know, I sort of put out my, my pointer finger and, and was blaming if it wasn't for 2020, I would, I'd be in the best, I'd still be in the best shape of my life. I'd still be, you know, blah, blah. And, and then I realized, mm, yeah, that's just a big excuse. You have the capacity to uh, choose when you get up, choose when you go to bed, choose if you're going to, you know, what you're going to put in your mouth, choose whether you're going to exercise. That's all within your control, you know? And so it's been over the last, just this last couple, these last couple of weeks where I thought I have to move myself back into the direction of those kinds of self-care, you know, activities. You touched on what makes you hopeful in the whole course that you're designing and your hope for what it will give to those that you are able to mentor and that study with you. What makes you hopeful for life right now? Oh, wow. Um, that is such a good question. And, and I suppose for me, it always comes down to being a person of faith. I surrender my life to God. I understand that I may not understand the full purpose of my life until my life is over. Um, I sort of surrender on that level and because so much of our fear is based on our sense of being out of control. At this moment in time, what I can control is my creative output. And so I am honing in and focusing on completing this big task in front of me. That is how I'm, uh, that's how I'm coping. It is what offers me hope. It is something, it's like being in the creative process. Anything that you create has the possibility of goodness inherent in it, you know, and, um, and that might provide hope for other people, right? That might be of service to other people. And so that's all I know to do, you know, um, is to is to trust God and sin bravely. <laughs> like, you know. That's it. It really is so on. So really yeah. show up full, ready yeah. to go. And if you fall and fail, well, hey, read a beautiful acronym the other day that failing was faithful attempt in learning. Fantastic. Okay, given that music was and is, I'm going to say is, you still are very much the singer. That's, you know, part of who you are and your gift and your talent. Mm -hmm. If there was a soundtrack to your life right now, what would be on it? Hmm. Well, there'd be a lot of James Taylor and there'd be a lot of Joni Mitchell. Mm. There would be a smattering of songs that I can only sort of describe as coming from Christian artists, the lyrics of which I feel like really they just resonate with my own journey and my life and, and my relationship to God. And there'd probably be a little bit of uh, Rosemary Clooney. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a big fan of, I'm a big fan of great music in any, in any genre, you know? So 
that would be tough, but I mean, those are the ones that last for me. I was listening to Hegira, which is a, a record of Joni Mitchell's from 1976. And I was talking to a friend about it and I was like, that is a, that is a desert island record for me. You know, like I know every word. I, I feel like, you know, she wrote that when she was in her, when she was 30. And I feel like her understanding of life, particularly the sorrows and the melancholy of life, like, oh, she's just so amazing. Um, and, and I listen to it now at age, you know, almost 60. I think I said it was going to be 60 in March, but I'm not. I'm going to be 59. I keep, I always, whenever I, I turn a certain age, I always start using the year ahead so that I don't shock myself, right? Like <laughs> That is so anti-lay. I know. So earlier today, I did a podcast and I said, yeah, I'll be 60 in March. And now I'm like, oh, wow. I'm going to be 59. Like all of a sudden I gained a year, right? It's hilarious. So silly. But um, I still listen to the lyrics on that record. And I think, oh, I, I'm still learning things from that record. It's crazy. River, for some reason, when I hear that, yeah. especially around this time of year, yeah. just cuts me in a way. I mean, even if it's yeah. a gorgeous fall day and the leaves are falling and blowing and it's, you know, that gorgeous and godlike really and yeah i yeah. could be driving that song comes on and i'm a puddle of tears yeah beautiful and you know what sarah sarah mclaughlin's version of it is gorgeous well there's uh sarah mclaughlin's there's also uh katie lang does a yeah. beautiful version of that james taylor does an interesting it's version just too. a beautiful song to start with yeah yeah thank you for this thank time you. thank you for having thank me thank you for being had <laughs> <laughs> happy to have been had. <laughs> and really look forward to all the good things that you're doing and continue to put out both creatively for your voice work and certainly your new coaching series. I, I'm you. really looking forward to that. Thank How you. cool is that, that you've got a production studio in your home and you're grasping hold of the, you know, learning the tools so that you can do what you want to do. And that's really yeah. you know, where we're at right now. I think all of us learning the tools in whatever facet so we can not only survive, but thrive. And yeah. is there anything else you'd like to share or say before we say goodbye? I don't know. I uh, I feel like this has been a pretty thorough podcast. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share the things I know and uh, share the things I don't. <laughs> <laughs> There's you know, a lot and, of people and, sharing things they don't these days. Yeah, and I, I just feel like you know, I my hope is to be an encouragement to people at at any. I've I've learned so many things in my fifties, and you know, as I sort of head toward my sixties, it's like I realize there's just so much, so much yet to learn and to do, and and to approach all of that with a spirit of wonder, and you know, no judgment, no nothing, just like wonder and excitement about what there is to know and learn and see. So that's sort of how I, I hope my life continues to move on that path. And I so believe it will. I hope that's a benefit to others to, to go do what you want, go do it. You know. <laughs> and that is part of, you know, being at an age where a life well lived in all its colors yeah. and being able to reach peers or reach down to other people and bring them up because otherwise what good is keeping all of this it's really meant to share. And yeah. I think you're doing that. I see you doing that yeah. and I really appreciate that. Appreciate you. And hopefully it won't be another 17 years <laughs> before. Oh, maybe the thing is I should have been wearing Caltrans orange all this time and I would have had more conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. No, we're going to get through all of this and then we're going to start seeing each other. Amen. Again. Amen. I want to have a trip to LA to visit family and friends and then I'll come visit you in South Pasadena Please. and you can take me to some of these places that I've heard you speak of for, you know, yeah. whether it's a cocktail or a, you, you mentioned something about a, I don't know if it was almond based, some ice cream that just sounded really decadent oh, and wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That's in, uh, that's in Burbank. Oh, in Burbank. Okay. It's almond milk based ice cream. It's so good. It sounds <laughs> so delicious. I hope it's still there. That's my hope. Yeah. Oh, I know. Is yeah. that what's we've seen so many places around us that it's really heartbreaking the mom and pop places. Oh. Oy. Yeah. oy oy. Well, Kate Bass, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Cheryl Holland. Thank you. I'm really privileged to be able to chat with you for I feel likewise. For a couple I hours. really do. And uh just take care of yourself and self care means a lot of different things. It's just look, eat the cookie, <laughs> do whatever, but just continue loving on yourself the way that you are because you're a light. 
and you're appreciated. And um, I hope you have a fantastic Christmas. Thank you. You too. Well, you're lovely. And uh, Merry, Merry Christmas to you. Thank you. And I'll see you online. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's what we do, right? That's what we do. Thank you, my dear. You are lovely as well. That concludes our Christmas edition of 19 Stories. I want to thank Kay Bess once again for spending the time with me and sharing her story. Join me next week when my guest will be Laura Mooney. She has a role in the new Pixar film, Soul which releases this Christmas Day on Disney+. Plus. Until then, a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you. I'd also like to thank the following news outlets for the use of their clips in so aptly painting the picture of the fear that we're facing during this pandemic. BBC, PBS, Now This, UNESCO, and Some Good News. I especially want to thank Joel and Luke Smallbone, otherwise known as the group for King and Country, for allowing me to use an excerpt of their song, Together which could not be a more hopeful and inspiring song for such a time as this. Finally, I'll leave you with the following from Proverbs 23, 18. Surely there is a future and your hope will not be cut off. Thank you again for joining me today. Feel free to offer feedback or a story idea at 19stories at soundsatchelstudios.com. Visit my website at soundsatchelstudios.com via Instagram at Cheryl Holling VO. I look forward to sharing more stories on the next episode of 19 Stories from Fear to Hope. Until then, stay healthy and hopeful. Together we are dangerous, together with our differences, together we are bolder, braver, stronger.